So the title of my talk is Objective Morality Without God. And uh, there's not a question mark after that. It's rather an assertion. So I think there can be objective morality without God. I'm going to uh, try to explain why I think that's so. Uh, and um, I think in the first thing to do is to be very clear about what I mean by the term objective, because this is a philosophical term, and like many a philosoph many an oft-used philosophical term, it's got lots and lots of different senses. So I want to be clear about the sense in which I am using the term uh, objectivity. And I have that here on the handout. It's the first entry. Uh, this is exactly what I mean when I say that morality is objective. I mean that two conditions apply, namely that moral rules apply to us regardless of our endorsements and regardless of whether they get us, obedience to them gets us what we care about or what we want. And furthermore, moral claims are true independently of any human being's opinion or our attitude taken towards such claims. So what I mean when I say that morality is objective is, I mean both of these things taken together, okay? That's my understanding of objectivity. So the claim is that basically human beings don't make up morality. It's not our opinions towards moral claims that make them true. It's not our attitudes towards moral claims that make them true. It's not the fact that moral requirements or moral rules serve our interests or get us what we care about, that make those rules or requirements plausible or correct. That's what I mean by making the claim that morality is objective. And I take it that, I hope that's not an idiosyncratic understanding. I just want to be clear about what I mean before we proceed. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to, with that understanding, uh, I want to lay out three challenges to the thought that morality can be objective without God, and I want to give you my, uh, my take on them. I think that these challenges are unsuccessful. I'll explain what the challenges are, and then I'll explain why I think they're unsuccessful, and then I'll turn the tables. So basically the first half of the talk is going to be um, my trying to anticipate critics. What I'm going to start by doing is by giving you three challenges to my thesis reasons that critics might think that my claim is false, and I'm going to give you my reply to each of those three in turn. And then I'm going to turn the tables and do a bit of criticism myself and go on the offensive, trying not to be offensive, while I go on the offensive and try to show that there are positive reasons for thinking that God's say-so is not the ultimate source of objective morality. Okay? And then I'll just wrap up with a lingering worry about my position, and then we'll talk with one another for about 45 minutes or an hour, I guess. Okay, so for the first of the three challenges to my position, my position being that uh, morality can be objective without God's authorship of morality. Um, and that's what I'm calling here on the handout the basic challenge, and I've laid it out as a three-step argument. Premise number one, if morality is objective, humans didn't create it. And two, if humans didn't create morality, then God did. Therefore, if morality is objective, then God created it. That conclusion is the conclusion I don't believe. Okay? That's the conclusion I'm trying to argue against. So here, here we've got a logically impeccable argument to a conclusion I don't accept. So it's incumbent on me, since I think that the logic is perfect of this argument, it's incumbent on me to try to say which of these two premises... I believe is mistaken. It's not premise one. Premise number one is correct. I think it's true by definition, by my understanding of what objectivity amounts to. If morality is objective, human beings did not create morality. I have no qualms with premise number one. In fact, it's a kind of test for whether you really uh, fully understand the go my conception of objectivity, that you see that premise number one is true. Okay? So I really have to take issue with premise number two. If humans didn't create morality, then God did. I think a lot of people believe premise number two. And when I think about why they do, I come up almost invariably with the following line of argument. And that line of argument is given on your handout just, just below that uh, basic challenge. And it's the, I say, for premise number two. 
And the basic idea, before I run through this, is this. That someone had to make up morality. Morality is just a bunch of rules, a bunch of moral rules. That's how I'm conceiving of morality right now. It's a, kind, it's a, it's a somewhat oversimple conception, but I think that's all we need to go with tonight. So the idea is that morality is a bunch of rules. It's a big laundry list. That lo big laundry list might be unified by one fundamental rule, like the golden rule, for instance. But it need not be. That's a separate question that I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna try not to get into tonight. But uh, regardless of how you answer that separate question, the basic idea is this. Morality consists of a bunch of rules, and like any rule, that set of rules has to have an author. We could think of these as rules. I use the terms rules or laws here on, for purposes of the handout interchangeably. Okay? The thought is that rules have to have an author. Laws need a legislator. Morality is a bunch of laws, if you like to talk of moral laws, or it's a bunch of rules, if you like to talk of moral rules. And these things need someone to underwrite them. They need someone to author them and to authorize them. And if morality is objective, then by definition, that someone cannot be any human being or even a collective of us, say, a society or a culture. So, who else could do it? There's an obvious answer to that question, and that is God. God's the person who could do it. But I think that underlying that line of thought I just gave you in the last 30 seconds is the following thought, namely that if any laws or rules exist, someone had to author them. Someone has to be in a position to authorize them. And I think that claim is mistaken. When I, uh, just below, when I say four premise two, I give an argument uh, that tries to, that does, in fact, pr uh, provide an argument whose conclusion is premise two of the basic challenge. So, here's the logic. You take a look at the basic challenge. I grant you premise number one. I push back against premise number two. I say, why do you think premise number two is correct? And what I've tried to do is I've tried to lay out then what I think of as the best defense for premise number two. And here it goes. It's that four-step argument just below. A law must have an author, or you could say a rule must have an author. I'm going to use these two terms interchangeably, laws and rules. If a law has, has to have an author, therefore, too, moral laws must have an author. And there are only two possible authors. This is three. There are only two possible authors of morality, humans, and God. And therefore, it follows, if humans didn't create moral laws, then God did. Okay. I think that premise number one of this supporting argument, the claim that a law must have an author, I think that's false. Okay. This argument here, this four-step argument, is meant to bolster premise number two of the, of the basic challenge. If, if humans didn't create morality, God did. Why well, think that? The, the rock-bottom thought behind premise number two of the basic challenge is this. If you've got a set of laws or rules, someone must have written them up, or someone must have conveyed them, someone must have authored them. I believe that's false. Okay? And I want to give you some examples to chew on. And you can come back at me in the Q&A if you don't find these plausible. So I think, for instance, that the laws of mathematics and the laws of logic have no author. I don't even think that God authored the laws of logic. God is constrained by the laws of logic. When we talk about God's omnipotence, when we do, what we mean is God can do everything within the limits of logic. God cannot flout the laws of logic. God cannot make two contradictory claims simultaneously true, for instance. I don't think that's, a limita that's, I don't think that's an undue, inappropriate, worrisome limitation on God's power. If it's not, then, uh, well... I don't think what I was about to say is false, so let me not say that. But instead what I want to say is uh, <laughs> instead what I want to say is this. I don't think that the laws of logic have an author. Uh, and there are other laws as well, I think, um, that lack an author. Or uh, the laws of rationality, for instance. I think it's irrational for someone to set out to mutilate himself just for its own sake. Not because he wants, not because the mutilation is going to get him something else, but he just says, ah, self-mutilation, that's for me. I'm going for it. That person's irrational. And we can explain that by saying there's a rule of rationality that says self-mutilation pursued for its own sake is irrational. I think that rule is true. 
That's not the fundamental rule of rationality, but it is a rule of rationality, I think. I think it's true, and I don't think that anyone made it up. There are rules in epistemology, the study of uh, the theory of knowledge. One such rule says this. If you have a belief on the basis of no evidence and in the face of all contrary evidence, then your belief is unjustified. I think that's a true principle, a true rule about the justification of beliefs. I don't think anybody made it up. So what I've just done is I've tried to give you examples in which it's at least superficially plausible, we can talk about this, of course, in the Q&A, it's superficially plausible to think that human beings didn't make these rules up, and we don't need God to have made those rules up either. So what we have is the possibility of laws without any author. And if that's so, then the first premise of the supporting argument, the claim that the law must have an author, is mistaken. So that's my analysis of what I call the basic challenge. With the basic challenge, I accept premise number one, but I reject premise number two, and I do so because I think there's a problem with the line of argument, this four-step argument here, with the line of argument designed to support premise number two. Now I want to talk about a couple supplemental challenges. The first of which is, has to do with moral reasons. And, and in reading over uh, my notes beforehand, I see I've got a little typo here. Let me take you through, uh, before I take you through this argument, let me just give you uh, the core of the argument uh, in a nutshell. The idea is this, that when it comes to morality, morality, any plausible morality, has to have a certain special feature. The special feature is that whatever you're morally required to do, you have excellent reason to do. In other words, we always have excellent reason to do our duty. That calls out for explanation. Why is it that we always have excellent reason to do our duty? Well, he, uh, a prominent answer is this. We have excellent reason to do our duty because God underwrites our duty. And if we, are to, if we ever to flout the moral law, then we stand to be punished in the worst possible way. On the other hand, we have excellent, so we have, in fact, two reasons for moral obedience. One is the threat of punishment if we don't adhere to the moral law. And the other is the prospect of eternal bliss if we do adhere to the moral law. So that's what explains why we have excellent reason for being moral and doing our duty. Namely, God's in the picture and God promises eternal bliss to those who hew to the moral law and promises eternal damnation or at least a, a bit of suffering and sorrow for those who don't. Okay? That's the idea behind ensuring that God has a role in underwriting the moral law. And what I tried to do is I tried to capture that informal line of reasoning I've just given you by means of this argument here, this three-step argument under the heading moral reasons. It goes like this. Moral requirements are legitimate only if we always have excellent reason to obey them. The thought being that if, you, if, if you've got a moral requirement but no reason at all to obey it, that's not really a, a legitimate moral requirement. That shows that that's just a fake, a, uh, you know, uh, a counterfeit moral requirement. You have to have, if it's a genuine moral requirement, you've got to have an excellent reason to obey it. We always, premise number two, we always have excellent reason to obey moral requirements only if God exists. And it follows logically from one and two that therefore moral requirements are legitimate only if God exists. Okay. I myself endorse premise number one, though it's a source of a lot of controversy among philosophers. Many philosophers reject premise number one. They think it's possible, they think this is a very sensible question to ask. Namely, I know that doing, that, say, giving to charity is my moral duty, but do I have any reason to do that? And many philosophers think that for some people, in some circumstances, the answer to that question might be, no, I don't. I don't go along with those philosophers, but I'm not, um, I'm not really here to give you, to, to have a separate talk about that. What I want to do is, again, register my agreement with the premise of this argument. I endorse premise number one of this argument, but I think premise number two is problematic. Why think that premise number two is true? Why think it's the case that we always have excellent reason to obey moral requirements only if God exists? Well, on the handout here, I give, you, I give you an argument for premise number two. It goes like this. We always have excellent reason to obey moral requirements only if doing so always serves our self-interest. 
and doing our duty does always serve our self-interest, but only if God exists. And therefore, we always have excellent reason to obey moral requirements only if God exists. The conclusion of that argument is premise number two that we had seen before. Okay, so I was asking, I, I don't accept premise number two of this moral reasons argument. So I'm asking the person who's advancing the argument, why believe it? Here's what I think to be the best argument for premise number two. And I've just given that uh, there. I think that that argument fails. I don't endorse that supporting argument for premise number two. Okay. And the reason I don't is because I don't accept premise number one of that supporting argument. What premise number one says is this. All your reasons have one source, self-interest. If you've got a reason to do something, there's got to be something in it for you. And here's the thought. Whenever I do my moral duty, if God exists, there always is something in it for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that much closer to heaven, or I'm going to get that much farther away from hell. Because God's got the promise of either eternal reward or punishment for those who comply or fail to comply with the moral rules. Okay? But the underlying thought here, as expressed in premise number one of the supporting argument, we always have excellent reason to obey moral requirements, only if doing so serves our self-interest, I think that is mistaken. I think that self-interest is a source of reasons. The fact that something is going to benefit you counts as a reason for you to do it. But I don't think it counts as the only reason for you to do it. And that's what that supporting first premise says. Is that there's only one source of your reasons to act in one way or another, and that is self-interest. I deny that. I think that the interests of others, for instance, serve as a source of reasons. The fact that someone needs my help and I can provide it very easily, is by itself a reason for me to provide that help. My self-interest doesn't enter into it at all. So, I think that the supporting argument, what I regard as the best supporting argument for premise number two of the moral reasons argument, I think is flawed because of its first premise, which is a version of egoism. It's a version of the claim that the only thing that's important are things that redound to my self-interest. In particular, the, the thought is that the only thing I have reason to do is, are things that will help me out, will benefit me. And I think that's a mistake. I think we have direct reason to help other people in a variety of circumstances, even if we don't stand to benefit thereby. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to skip the moral motivation arguments. If you took a quick glance down this handout and said, Moral motivation, I'm all over that. I can't wait till he talks about that. I'm sure he's got something mistaken to say about that. Well, I may well have something mistaken to say about it, but I'm not going to say it until we talk about until we do the Q&A, just because I'm taking a look at the time. Okay? I don't want uh, to engender hostility on the part of my audience for yakking at you too long. So what, I do, what I'd like to do is... If you have issues about the moral motivation concerns, the thought is that in order to ensure more moral motivation, good motivation on the part of people, God's got to get into the picture. That's the basic idea. Okay? If you think that, and if you uh, don't like the, the little argument I've got here on the handout, then I just invite you to raise questions about that in the Q&A. I'd be very happy to talk about it. But I'd like to move on a little bit and talk, um, instead, uh, turn the, do what I call turning the tables now, and try to begin to provide an answer to the question, how is it possible that morality could be objective without God? And I'm going to give you the beginnings of an answer, which I assume aren't, the beginnings are not going to persuade anyone. That's why they're just called the beginnings. But I'm going to build on the beginnings. And here's the beginning of my answer to the question, how could morality be objective even if God's not in the picture? I'm not saying even if God doesn't exist. I'm just saying even if God doesn't author uh, morality. Although the answer I give is compatible with atheism, would compatible with the thought that God, in fact, does not exist. Okay. So the beginnings of the answer come with, as I say on the handout, a description of a clear case of, an uncontroversial case of immorality. 
What I want you to do is, I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to spend more than 10 seconds on this because it's an unsavory task, but I want to invite you to think about a very gross, extraordinarily serious kind of immorality that people can perpetrate on one another. And, you know, a number of things come to mind. I don't want to dwell on the particulars, but just imagine a case, for instance, of political torture in which we have a despotic regime, a tyrannical regime, who has isolated those who um, are uh, advocating on behalf of freedom, and basic liberties. And uh, the, the folks at the top of the regime want to retain their power, and so they identify the people who are uh, members of the leadership of a pro-democracy force, and they apprehend them and take them to a torture cell. And then they begin to torture them in the very worst way that you can imagine. I'm not going to lay out the graphic details. Okay. If you contemplate a situation like that, my thought is this, that, the act, that what's going on in the torture cell is immoral. And I want, I want this to be an uncontroversial case. I guess the only way to do that is to lay out the details, but I actually am unwilling to do that. I just had dinner. You probably just had dinner. I, don't, you know, I just don't want to go into the unsavory details, but just imagine the worst sort of torture a person can perpetrate on another. And then I want you to imagine something that's going to be very difficult for you, but I want you to try to do it anyway. And I, then I want you to try to imagine that God doesn't exist. And I want you to ask this question. I see some people just, their jaws just dropped. Okay? Maybe you're tired. Maybe, okay. I want you to imagine that God doesn't exist, and I want you to imagine surveying the scene that's going on in this torture cell. I want you to answer this simple question. Is what's going on there immoral? I think the answer to that question is yes. And I think the answer to that question is clearly yes. That is, we can say of what's going on in that torture cell that it's immoral, and we don't need to make reference to God's will or God's commands in order to say that. We can, if we want... We can introduce that as a further additional explanation. But my thought is this. When you contemplate the nature of torture in and of itself, vividly, and see the kind of absolute dominance of one human being over another, the kind of gross power imbalance, the kind of extraordinary pain that's inflicted there, the kind of, if information is sought, the kind, the kind of unreliability of the information obtained, if you obtain any information at all. Think of all of those things, and my thought is this. Thinking of those features of the action is enough to make it clearly immoral. You don't also need to ask yourself a further question. Does God forbid this? Does God allow this? Contemplate the nature of torture in and of itself, if you can vividly call that up to mind, is enough to know that that action is immoral. And if that's so, we've got the beginnings of an answer to my question, because what we've got is the possibility that actions are indeed more immoral, or if we took an exact opposite kind of case, moral, without introducing God into the picture. But instead, just talking about the specific features that confer, that make an action immoral. Like, um, it's exemplifying gross power imbalance. It's exemplifying complete mastery of one human being over another. It's imposing, uh, it's um, the perpetrators being sadistic and taking pleasure in imposing pain on another. The presence of extraordinary pain that's unwanted. I've just retailed five features which together I think suffice to make us think that this kind of action is immoral and none of those five features mention God. Now let me try to strengthen my case. Okay. What I want to do is, I want you to consider, I want to undertake a consideration now in the next ten minutes of a theory that philosophers know as the divine command theory. The divine command theory is what I laid out on the handout, the claim that an act is morally required just because it's commanded by God as it's divinely commanded, and it's immoral just because it's forbidden by God. The idea behind divine command theory is this. God is the author of morality. Before God surveyed the scene, nothing was right. Nothing was wrong. God, whenever God decided to lay down the moral law, before that happened, everything was morally neutral. 
It was only after God's decree, God's having made it command of one kind or another, that things became right if God commanded them, or wrong if God forbade them. That's the, that's the uh, governing thought behind the divine command theory. The divine command theory says that there can be no objective morality without God because God is the author of morality. And I think that that's a very natural thought for a theist to have. But I also think it's a mistaken thought. And now I'm going to tell you why. There's, uh, and, and this is not uh, an objection that originates with me, but rather it originates with Plato 2,500 years ago. On the handout, I've got what I call the Euthyphro objection. For those of you who are not familiar with this, Euthyphro, was, um, Euthyphro is the name of a dialogue that Plato wrote. It's about 11 pages. And Euthyphro is the title character. It's bad to be the title character of a platonic dialogue because these people, <laughs> as you know, okay, I'm getting some laughs, so you've all read Plato, though. Uh, if you're the title character in a platonic dialogue, you're shown to be an ass by the end of the dialogue. <laughs> and it usually only takes ten pages to show it. Uh, so, bummer for Euthyphro. He goes down in history as this real jerk. So, the, ba the, back the background is Euthyphro... Uh, catches up with Socrates right in front of the law courts. What are you doing here, Socrates? Uh, I'm defending my life against uh, some, you know, some capital charges. What are you doing here, Euthyphro? I'm here to prosecute a murderer. Really, says Socrates. Who is it? My father, says Euthyphro. One of his slaves killed another, and in punishment, my father set the murderer, tied him up, and kept him outside, where he froze to death overnight. So my father is a murderer, and I'm here to punish him. Back then, in ancient Greece, they didn't have DAs, you know, or federal prosecutors or anything like that. Anybody could come and bring a lawsuit against anybody else. So it, it's as much a violation. It's not, I don't know if taboo may be too strong, but the Greek audience would recoil in the same way that we recoil at the prospect of a son prosecuting his father for murder. Even if his father really is a murderer, there's something, if not quite taboo about, certainly something um, deeply off-putting about a son taking that role towards his father. And Socrates says, what could possibly motivate you to do this? And Euthyphro says, piety. Piety demands that I prosecute my father. And that's all Socrates needs to hear, because Socrates says at that point, are you telling me, Euthyphro, that you know what piety means? And Euthyphro says, he shows his, his youthful cockiness. He says, absolutely. Socrates says, you know what? I have always wanted to know what piety is. Could you please tell me? And then Euthyphro is like, oh no, get me out of here. But no, Euthyphro bravely stands up and shows himself to be really kind of dumb. But what, uh, in the course of this ten pages, what happens is Socrates asks a question called the Euthyphro question. It's come to be called the Euthyphro question. And remember, they were polytheists, not, not monotheists back then. We're talking about piety, not moral rightness or being morally required. But here's the question as it originally occurred. Do the gods love an action because it's right, or are actions right because the gods love an, that action? Now, let's just transpose it to the modern day and talk about rightness and be, be monotheist about it, and so we can ask this question. Are actions right, or let's say morally required, are actions our moral duty because God commands us to perform them, or does God command us to perform actions because those actions are right? My thought is that, and this is Plato's thought too, so it's got to be right. No, that's not, that's not my reasoning. Plato got it wrong sometimes. But what Plato said was, uh, he put, these, put the words into Socrates' mouth. What he said was that it's the second option that's correct. You probably forgot the second option already because it's already seven after eight. So let me remind you what the second option is. The second option is God commands actions because they're right. They're not right because God commands them. God commands us to do things because those things are right. In other words, it's not God say so that makes actions right or wrong. But rather... It's God's in, infallible wisdom, God's omniscience, coupled with God's love for us, that makes it such that God knows everything that's right, knows everything that's wrong, and that God's certainly different from us. 
and because God cares about us, tells us at least part of the contents of the moral law. God doesn't, on that picture though, God's not making it up. God's not saying, oh, what am I, you know, I just created the earth. What do I got to do today? Uh, ah, moral law. Okay. Let's see. What should go, let's see. I see, um, you know, nobody's around yet, but I see what's going to come down the pipe. Um, rape. Commanded or forbidden? I don't know. Somebody got a coin? That's not what's going on, right? That, that sounds mildly blasphemous, right? But at the, at the minimum, it sounds ridiculous. Why does it sound ridiculous? It sounds ridiculous if it does to you, precisely because, I, I don't know, it's your mind, not mine, but I'm, I'm imagining it. If it sounds ridiculous to you, it sounds ridiculous because when you contemplate the nature of rape, you see intrinsically, that is, in and of itself, by virtue of its very own nature, rape is a gross immorality. Of course, God saw that too. The same thing with torture. The same thing with slavery. And that's exactly why God forbade us to partake in such actions. Because God saw the wrongness inherent in such actions. And cares about us enough to relay that fact, or that set of facts, to us. But on that picture, what happens is we preserve the omniscience of God, the all-knowingness of God, and the omnibenevolence, the perfect love that God has at the cost of making God the author. And let me explain the line I've just been taking for the last three or four minutes by means of this argument, the objection I call the Euthyphro objection. It goes like this, it's that four-step uh, argument on the handout. Either God's got reasons for his commands or he doesn't. I, I, say, I speak of God as a him. Um, for those of you who don't want to assign a gender to God, but this is just shorthand, okay? Um, either God's got reasons for his commands or he doesn't. And that premise has to be true. One of those two options has to be correct. Okay? So we're, ima we're imagining God at the point at which God is, uh, thinking, is making up the moral law. That's the, the that's scenario. Um, and uh, so either God's got reasons to back up his commands or he doesn't. First option. If God doesn't have any reasons to back up those commands, if it's really the flip of the coin... What's it going to be? Is rape going to be forbidden, or is it going to be commanded? If it's really the case that God has no reasons whatever to back up his commands, then his commands are arbitrary. That is, by definition, they're just not supported by adequately good reasons. That's what being arbitrary means. So if God had no reasons to back up his commands to us, then, by definition, his commands are arbitrary. But if they're arbitrary, they're, they are inappropriate as the basis of morality. You don't want the foundations of morality to be arbitrary choices. It can't be that a flip of the coin is going to determine, that a proverbial flip of the coin is going to determine what's forbidden and what's not. On the contrary, when it comes down to the very essence, the very core, the very foundations of morality, we precisely don't want them based on arbitrary foundations. We want them based on the best foundations, on the best most excellent reasons. And so I think it's natural to shy away from premise number two and go instead to premise number three. God does have reasons for his commands. And God, of course, being perfect, perfect, has the very best possible reasons for his commands. But if that's so, then morality is based on those reasons. It's not based on God's say-so. It's based on the reasons themselves. So, for instance, if you take torture and ask why torture is immoral, what you need to do is, and this goes back to what I called the beginnings of an answer. What God saw was that torture exemplified complete mastery of one human being over another, and that that is wrong. God saw the kind of extraordinary pain that's undertaken in torture, and saw that that is wrong. And God, having seen all of the excellent reasons to oppose torture, and caring about us, then laid down the law that said, don't torture. But in that case, God's say-so is not making torture wrong. God sees that torture is wrong and lays it down for us to follow that rule, don't torture. So, 
It follows from 1, 2, and 3 that therefore either God's commands are arbitrary, as if God issues commands without reasons, or they're not, or they are based on reasons. But either way, morality isn't based on God's commands. I think this argument is sound. I think it's logically perfect, I hope. And I also think that all three of those premises are true. Okay? So if you don't like the conclusion, you've either got to show me that, in fact, the lo- you know, I made a logical screw-up, or you've got to show me which of those premises is wrong and why. Okay. I've got a supporting argument, what I call the immorality objection. I'm not as impressed with this, but this is a very popular objection to the, to the divine command theory. So I thought we'd get it out on the table, at least, so we could talk about it in Q&A. And, that, and the objection goes like this. If acts are right because, just because God commands them, rape would be right were God to command it. But it wouldn't be right, even if God were to, were to command it, and therefore it's not the case that acts are right because God commands them. I think the logic, again, in that argument is uh, impeccable. And if you don't like that conclusion, you've got to pick one of those two premises to take issue with. So we could talk about that in the Q&A. So yeah, I just want to wrap up now. 42 minutes later, here's the wrap up. And that's leaving you with a, pro- a lingering worry, a problem about my position. And here's, what the ling- here's the lingering worry. If it's really the case that God is not the author of morality, but instead the infallible conveyor, relayer of morality, the infallible voice of morality without being the author of morality, if that's really so, if God didn't create morality and humans didn't create morality, and I don't think that humans did create, did create morality. There is such a thing as conventional morality, but I think there's objective morality as well. Okay. So, but if neither God uh, nor human beings create morality, where did it come from? What is the ultimate source of moral truth, what makes moral claims true? And I want to give you an answer that might sound really feeble. It probably will sound really feeble, so you can push me on this in the Q&A. I think there are two ways to to understand this question. What makes a moral claim true? Here's a claim. It's a moral claim. I think it's true. Torture is immoral in almost every circumstance. It might be immoral in every circumstance. I don't want to get involved in that really hard question. Okay? So I hedge, my, I hedge my claim. I just say, torture is immoral in almost every circumstance. I think that claim, it's a moral claim. I think it's true. So you should naturally, hey, you say, hey, Russ, big ethics professor, what makes it true? It's a moral claim. Can you explain to me what makes it true? I say, well, there are two ways you can, I can do the ethics professor thing. There are two things you might mean by that question. Let's make a <laughs> distinction. Okay? Um, all the professors are laughing, but none of the students are. <laughs> but you've already suffered enough from that kind of move. Okay. Um, but anyway, I do think there are two important ways you can understand this question. What is it that makes this claim true? Torture is immoral. Let's just shorten it up with the understanding that maybe in certain rare cases it's not immoral. Okay. Let's just leave that aside. Let's just talk about this basic claim. Torture is immoral. What makes it true? I think there are two ways to answer that question. One is by trying to talk about the specific features of torture that actually make it immoral. And I've done that in a couple different contexts already. So what you'd want to do is an answer to the question, why is torture immoral? What makes it true that torture is immoral? What you want to do is talk about the kind of uh, absolute mastery of, it shows uh, of one human being over another. You want to talk about the extraordinary pain that it imposes. You want to talk about unreliability as a source of information and other things. These features taken together, I think, do explain why torture is immoral. But you might then, putting your philosophy cap on, you might say, you know what? I'm going a little deeper. And your philosophy professors are going to applaud you. Yeah, go deeper. And you might ask, in that case, why is it the Let's just focus on one feature, the extraordinary pain of torture. Why is it that when an action imposes extraordinary pain on a human being without that human being's consent and not for any benefit to that human being, why is it that that feature of an action makes the action wrong? 
That's why I said there are two levels of depth here. Maybe, maybe I, That's just a metaphor. There are two kinds of questions you can be asking when you ask, what makes a moral claim true? The first thing you might be asking is, what specific features make this action moral or immoral? Okay. But then you might push deeper and say, why do those features have that kind of power? Here's a feature. Imposing extraordinary pain without benefiting the victim and without the victim's consent. Russ, you claim that if an action has that feature, that makes the action immoral. That explains the immorality of the action. Okay? Well, that's a relative, you might say, that's a relatively superficial explanation. Go deeper. Why is it that that feature is as powerful as it is? Why does that feature make an action wrong? And here you might be tempted to say, because God assigned that feature its wrong-making role. God's say-so explains why uh, unconsented to extraordinary pain makes an action wrong. And what I say is, I don't buy that. And the reason I don't buy it is because of the Euthyphro objection. God, if God exists, and God is morally perfect, and God is omnibenevolent, all loving towards us, then God sees what's wrong with torture, sees that torture is wrong, and then lays down that law for our benefit. But God say so does not have the power to make something that is morally neutral morally wrong or morally right. Instead, it's when God surveys the scene, God takes a look at torture and sees that it's wrong, sees that it's bad, and tells us not to do it because it's bad. In this picture, God is, this is, uh, I don't mean this to be at all blasphemous or heretical, God is like a perfect kind of crystal ball, in this sense. Imagine we had a magic crystal, well, it's not magic, we don't know how it works, just like we don't know how God works. We have a crystal ball, and all we know is this, it always tells us, with 100% accuracy, what's going to happen tomorrow. Whenever we consult it, it's never wrong. We don't know how it does it. Now, what I want to say is, with regard to this crystal ball, this crystal ball, let's say, has worked every day for the last thousand years. So we've got excellent reason to trust it. It's, as far as we know, an infallible indicator of what's going to happen over the next 24 hours. The crystal ball doesn't cause all these things to happen in the future. The crystal ball just records what's going to happen, and and presents it to us for our benefit. If I'm right, God plays the same role with regard to morality. God does not make things right or wrong, but instead God infallibly relays what is already right and wrong to us. So, this is just an analogy. It's imperfect in various ways that you can probe in Q&A. But my take on it is this that when you ask the deeper question, why is it that causing unconsented to extraordinary pain, not for the benefit of the victim, makes, something, makes an action wrong? There are two kinds of answers you can give. One is because that feature, the causing unconsented to pain, blah, 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 that feature is frowned upon by someone, God, or if you're a relativist, by our culture. That's one kind of answer. Things, uh, things possess the moral powers they do to make actions right or wrong because someone disapproves of them or someone approves of them. The other answer is my answer. I'm sure it's going to be completely unpopular. And that answer is no answer at all. The answer is this. Some features of actions just do make those actions wrong. Not because anyone disapproves of those features. They just do. So, there is there either my view or something like the divine command theory view is true. Namely, when, it get, when you get down to the deepest level of ethical inquiry and you ask, why is it that imposing terrible unconsented, uh, unconsented to pain is wrong? 
There are two answers, there are two ways you can go. One is, it just is wrong. It's intrinsically wrong. When you consider the very nature of doing a thing like that, it's wrong. The other answer is, in and of itself, it's perfectly morally neutral. There is nothing in and of itself wrong with imposing extraordinary pain that's not consented to. That's morally neutral. It's only when someone, God, each individual, culture, take your pick, it's only when someone frowns on that feature that that feature becomes wrong. There's nothing in and of itself wrong with the feature. I think that taking that latter route leads you to a euthyphro objection. And that's why I don't favor it. And so instead take the view that some kinds of actions are in and of themselves, that is intrinsically, inherently immoral, and others are inherently, intrinsically, morally good. Let's stop and uh, take your questions. Okay. What's your position on natural law? What's my position on natural law? Uh, let's see, do I have uh, one minute or 30 seconds? Yes, it, um, <laughs> Well, I, don't, um, I guess I can't answer that question easily because I'm not sure what you mean by natural law. Excuse me? Yes, um, okay. So I, what I, I think is that that kind of picture is, um, is not a very plausible picture. There's, um, I'm not taking issue with the question. I'm just going to leave the whole issue of you know, whether God created human beings aside. Let's just take that for granted. I think that um, God, uh, let's assume that God created human beings and created us with a purpose. Uh, but I still think that the prob what I call the euthyphro objection applies even to that uh, version of the, that uh, conception of the origin of morality. So we can ask, did God create us with a purpose for, you know, whatever his purpose was, for a reason or not? If it was just an arbitrary purpose that God assigned to us, then that purpose can't be authoritative in determining what's right and what's wrong for us to do. Yes, sir. Uh, two things. First of all, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a huge part of the YouTube pro was um, Socrates' projection of YouTube pro's statement was the very nature of the Greek god and the fact that they were, he used the example that they frequently issued decrees which were contradictional. Right, right. And that they were not a unified whole, but they were making, that they were obviously being completely arbitrary because they were disagreeing with each other. Right. So, I'm not, I guess I'm just not sure that a lot of those um, comparisons really roll over to the Christian idea of God, which is very much different from how right. the Christian God. That's you're absolutely right. So for those, that, could you hear him in the corner there? Yeah. Okay. So you're. I think you're absolutely right that there there are actually a battery of objections that Socrates levels to Euthyphro's understanding of piety. One of them is that it can't be that the gods authored morality because they disagree with one another, and that would yield an internally contradictory, inconsistent, and, and hence incoherent battery of moral rules. Um, and I also think that when you're dealing with monotheism, that objection doesn't apply at all. You're right. But that's not the, you know, that I take, that's not the objection I recounted here, and I think that the objection I have here doesn't depend on that objection, which I think is cogently met by monotheism. Okay. Um, that aside, can you, can you give, can you give a, a very a clear definition of morality that does not simply have anything to do with the way you feel about an action? Um, uh, no. <laughs> that, that's because that's because I can't give a clear definition of morality. I don't know. I don't have one. You might say, God. What a loser. The guy has been the guy's been teaching ethics for twenty years and he can't even define a subject. But you know, you know, so they could have they could have you know, if I was around in Socrates' time, there could have been a dialogue for me. I could have been the pompous ethics professor. Oh, hey Socrates, guess what? I'm teaching morality today. Oh, Socrates says, I've 
always wanted to know what morality is. <laughs> Could you give me the necessary and sufficient conditions? Could you give me a definition of morality? And the, and the lame thing is, no, I can't. So you might say, well, uh, so basically what you're asking, I, I guess there are two parts to your question. One is, can you define morality? That's the part I was fastening on. And the other is, can you define morality without making a reference to your feelings? Okay. I don't think that one's feelings are essential to the definition of morality. But that I think that's a lame thing for me to say because I don't have a definition of morality to offer you. So I can't, you know, I can't back that up and guarantee it by giving you a feeling-free definition of morality. Because I can't give you a definition of morality. Okay, we're going to move on and give someone else a chance. Way in the back there. I definitely agree that your future of objection is sound, but it seems like uh, if God, if um, morality was based on like, his reasons, God's reasons instead of being arbitrary, that he has different options for his reasons. So I'm wondering how you might answer the claim that the reasons don't necessarily exist outside of himself, or because God is essentially anything that exists, that they're that the moral rules are his character expressed in the natural world. Yeah. So I, th I guess I would, take, um, uh, I would take issue with the claim that God is essentially anything that exists in the world. I don't, I don't believe that myself. I don't think that God is this pad of paper, for instance. Um, or other, you know, you know, think of disgusting things. I don't think God is that, for instance. So... Um, I, so, let me see, can I, I don't think, I probably owe you an answer to some other part of your question, though, since, uh, I, think that's sufficient. I think, I think it's sufficient to answer that I have a different view of God than you may have, and that's oh. totally different, that's a huge okay. discussion after that, but I, I'm satisfied. Sure. Right, oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess kind of a follow-up to that on your, uh, Promise too, if God doesn't have good reasons for his commands, then they're arbitrary. Right. My only thought would be if God must have good reason for his commands, then he's not God, for he must answer to someone or something else above him, and so by definition is no longer God. Or another way to put it would be um, God, God's rules or laws don't flow from him commanding them uh, or why he thinks they're good, but from who he is. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so I see that's a natural follow-up there. And so I, what I want to do is um, I would like to reply by invoking that brief comment I made about uh, the laws of logic, for instance, because I think that's the most apt comparison here. I think that um, it might be an, you know, the natural worry, the natural theistic worry is this, that if you take a line like mine, which is also a line that's taken by many, many theologians, by the way, um, that's, but that should be neither here nor there. That's not, you know, that sounded, that might have sounded like an argument from authority, and I don't want to make that kind of argument. But if you take, if you take that line, I'm sorry, the line that says, there is something um, that God didn't, there are laws that God did not author. Then the worry is, well, there's something above and beyond God that he has to answer to. And that's a, that's a reduction of God's powers. But God is all-powerful, and therefore it couldn't be God that we're talking about if God is subject to these laws. Well, I think that um, I think that's not so. I think that it's that uh, a, an acceptable understanding of God's omnipotence is one according to which God is is uh, capable of doing anything at all within the laws of logic. God cannot, for instance, make Himself anything other than divine. You might say. You know, I never thought of that, but now that I think about that, if God can't make himself anything other than divine, that shows that that's not really God, because there's something God can't do, and God can do everything. Therefore, that's not God. But I think that is God. It's, it, and because it's actually an essential uh, trait of God, that God can't be anything other than divine. God's a necessarily existing being, and necessarily existing, is necessarily divine as well. So you might say, but uh, what I'm trying to say is, by your logic, what you'd, uh, you'd be forced to say is that any being who can't be anything other than divine can't be God. And what I'd say is, yeah, he 
He can't be God. In fact, that's an essential trait of being God. And being limited in the way, I know this sounds bad, but I, I'll just put it right out there. Being limited by the laws of logic, that is, having all of one's choices being constrained by the laws of logic, being incapable of doing anything other than doing what's logical, that is not a sharp reduction on God's power. I think it's compatible with a being, with, with, uh, with an entity's being God. That an entity can't do anything other than respect the laws of logic. And I want to say the very same thing about morality. And this, in fact, I want to say more than that. It's an essential trait. It's an essential trait of God's being God. That God can't do anything other than adhere to the moral law. God cannot do anything that's immoral. That's another way of saying that. God, can't, God cannot possibly do anything immoral. That's another way of saying, by my lights, that God can't do anything but adhere to the laws of morality. It's not that logic precedes God. Logic, the, lo the laws of logic are co-existent with God. That is, they're eternal. I'm going to go right here, and then here, and then in the middle, I think is the way the hands came up. Okay, so um, just kind of like in response to a question that was asked just a couple of times ago. So could it be possible that the moral laws somehow like, exist in God's own character? So when you talk about like, God recognizing the moral law, it's really like, it's like he is like a platonic form or something. It's like that exists in the nature of God, and he recognizes it. So it's somehow that like morals are connected to his nature. What's against his nature? Yeah, well, I think that, I think that's a coherent kind of view. It's very like the view, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's very like the view that I just offered, in fact, in, in response to this question, namely that it's an essential part of God, of who God is, an essential part of God's character, if you will, that God um, is in Kate, in a, this is going to sound like a limitation, but see, I don't think that this, this is really a problematic limitation. God is incapable of acting immorally. Now, when you put it that way, you might say, well, then that can't be God, because God's capable of doing everything. But when you think about it, I don't think it's a problematic limitation, Right? And it, it, fall, it falls out of my conception of the source of morality that if there is a God, God is such that God's incapable of acting immorally. Now, whether, that, whether uh, that's because the, the moral laws somehow... See, this is where it gets tricky. Somehow define God's character or are imbued in God's character or have their source in God's character. That's where things get very tricky and I'm, I'm not sure I've got something new to say other than what I've said with the Euthyphro objection here. Okay, over here. Let's get started. Yeah, um, we can a social situation. Um, so the actions of torturing only apply to human beings, not so much to animals. Like if an animal ate another animal that's alive, that wouldn't be immoral because they're not in Mago Bay. Because I would say that uh, and it wouldn't be immoral because animals aren't capable of proper moral assessment. They're not, they're not moral agents. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's okay. What I thought. And, um, uh -huh. So then, so I don't know. It kind of goes along with all the other questions that were just asked about. Um, so it's wrong between human beings and us being made in the modern day. Um, would, wouldn't that then imply? I guess. I'm not so much, I guess I'm just fleshing it out. You were saying that the moral, morality is inherent within God, then, and coexistent with God. And so it's not so much that one is in a hierarchy above the other, it's so much that they are just like, that they are one almost. Like, God is, in, like, all the, I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, I'm kind of confused. Yeah, well, yeah, that makes two of us now. <laughs> okay, well, what, um, what I want to do is I want to be officially neutral on the theological question about the composition of God's character and whether God is um, imbued in some way with morality, whether morality is nothing other than an expression of God's character. And, and instead, just say this, and I'll let you get, come back. And as it... Um, I get my, the question I'm trying to focus on is what the, the ultimate source of the moral rules or moral laws is. And in, in particular, the question of whether God's say-so 
is that ultimate source? And to that question, I answer no. It's compatible with, with saying no to also believe that God's character is wholly morally perfect. In fact, that's, I, I think any theist should believe that. But I think that it would be, in fact, very difficult to believe that God is wholly morally perfect if you held the divine command theory. Because what falls from divine command theory is that God's, God, whatever God does is moral just because God says so. And that is, that's actually not our, our picture of moral perfection, is it? And so our, our picture of moral perfection is such that we've got these laws and there's no possible way you can flout them. But in that case, I, I think it makes best sense to see these laws not as issuing from the will of anyone, but, in, but instead possessed of, in, in that sense, independent existence. That is, independent in the sense of not flowing from the, the choice or command or the will of anyone, not even God. Let's see, there was a question. Yeah, it's you, right there. Okay, I have a train of thought here, and uh, it's quite likely that you would, that you would differ from it in, in several ways before we get to the end. Uh, try, try and give us a, 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 a brief, uh, as comfort as possible. Yeah, thanks. You could argue that God has reason for setting up moral laws, in that he looked down the pipeline, as you put it, and, and saw that they would be right or wrong for us, that they would be based on the greater good. In that case, moral laws are the greater good. But what if you do wrong for a greater good? Or if you did that, you would be right. There are two ways to go with that. One, you could say that the current greater good, which is actually a moral wrong, is not actually the greater good in the future, long term, because of the moral compromises which would cause other problems. Or you could say that, yes, the ends justify the means. So, would the, moral, would the moral good without God, while existing, be different from the moral good with God, in which case the ends would not justify the means? <laughs> Should I say maybe to that question? Uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I don't want to try to repeat that question. I want. I want to tell you what I got. Out, I'll tell you what I want to tell you what I got out of that question, and then answer it on that basis, okay? And I'm not sure whether it actually captures your intentions, but here's what I got out of the question. That is whether or not. Um, I guess two things. One is whether morality is ultimately, whether moral rightness is ultimately a matter of serving a greater good, such that whatever possibly unsavory means you take, so long as they are effective in achieving that greater good, they are in fact morally required, even if they look, even if they involve, say, torture. Like, uh, people who engage in torture often try to morally justify it by saying that although this is unsavory in and of itself, it's nevertheless the morally right thing to do because it's the lesser of two evils and it will achieve this greater good in the long run. Okay? I think that that kind of thinking it, that kind of thinking is called util, utilitarian thinking. And I think there are deep problems with utilitarian thinking. Okay? Um, but I don't want to go into them here. I guess the second question you had was whether or not if we saw that kind of utilitarian reasoning as being underwritten by God, as opposed to not underwritten by God, we'd have a different conception of what morality requires of us. Is that a fair take on what your second question was? All right, maybe you can come up afterwards. There'll be a minute or two. I'll come over here and then. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was just. I'm sorry. I got the question out, and Jay was going to save me from having to answer it. So I guess I'll answer it. I'll try to answer it. And that is that. No, no. um, I think that uh, you know, it's it's hard for me to answer because I don't believe that utilitarianism is the objectively correct moral theory. Okay. But let's say I'm wrong about that, and it is the objectively correct moral theory. In that case, the answer to your second question is there should be no difference whatever between whether or not the ultimate good is one that God has told us is, is ultimately good, or whether God's out of the picture, and it just is ultimately good. Okay? There should be no answer, no, sorry, no difference to those two answers if utilitarianism is correct. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, how about um, okay, so it sounds to me like you're saying that something is wrong because you just know that it's wrong, and you don't need to make reference to a God to know that it is wrong. 
So it sounds to me like you're saying that morality and same thing with like the laws of logic and the laws of reason, they just exist and we know that they exist. You don't need a God to prove that they exist. So I get that and that's perfectly logical. However, where do those laws of morality, laws of logic come from? You, so I, yeah. Haven't gotten a satisfactory. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to give you a satisfactory sure. answer. But um, I'll tell you, there are two things actually I want to pick up on. The first thing is that you're, the way in which you characterize my position is a little different from the way I did because the, um, I, I didn't talk at, at any point about basing morality or the laws of logic on what we know to be true. Because what I want to, what I want to admit right off the top right off the bat is this. That if my picture of the object, of objective morality is correct, then there will be many cases in which we don't know what's right or wrong. It's, it's actually far easier to know what's right or wrong if we get to make up what morality is, right? So here's a subjectivist view that's, that says that what's right and wrong is in the eye of the beholder. If that kind of view is correct, then it's very easy to get moral knowledge. All you need to do is turn your attention to yourself and ask yourself what you think about things, right? And then you know what's right or wrong. If what's right or wrong is, you know, whatever you like or dislike. Okay, so I don't, I don't go for that. I have a view according to which we don't get to make up the, the ultimate moral law. But if we don't get to make it up, it might be really hard for us to know. In fact, I'm the first to confess that my limited moral understanding. Since I'm not the author of morality, there are lots of things about morality I don't know, including how to define it. Um, okay, um, so, I'm sorry, but the second thing is this, you still don't know, hey, Schaefer Landau, you still haven't told us where does morality come from? My answer is, basically, what you're asking when you ask that question is, it's got to come from someone, doesn't it? And my answer is no, it doesn't have to come from someone. But then, what am I left with? If it doesn't come from someone, what does it come from? And I'll give you the same answer about morality that I do, that I give about logic. And as it doesn't come from anyone, it's among the set of eternal truths. Blake, go ahead. Yeah, um, say God someone who Abraham to murder his son. How does my conception of God make sense of that? Well, what's my concept? Have I offered a conception of God here? Let's just. Yeah, I'm against the fantasy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, for those of you who couldn't hear the question, it says, so how do I make sense of this? So, you know, suppose God orders someone, let's call him Abraham, to murder his son. Well, I think that um, there's, you know, there's a problem with murder. And it's actually <laughs> going out on a limb here. Uh, but, that, you know, but that's actually easy because murder is defined as wrongful killing, right? So obviously there's a problem with murder. So if you're asking how, how to square the, the, um, the moral perfection of God with a command like that, I'm going to leave it to the theologians. You might have heard of this guy Kierkegaard. He had a shot at it. Um, and he wasn't the only one who had a shot at it. Oh, I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to beg off that one. And say I don't know how to answer. I'm going to go to this gentleman who's been patient, waiting patiently, and then over over here. All right. Um, that Speak up, please, so everyone can hear you. Sorry. Stand up. <laughs> so when you're offering your conception of the reason ultimately teachers are right or wrong, whether they're moral or moral, just saying it in and of itself, correct? That's right. So, it, yes, that's right. And, and then, but when you're offering up this idea that in and of itself, God is, is not just is characterized by, but is actually the moral law, it seems that you object to that and say that the moral law that has to be somehow above or separate from God. It seems that those two are equally valid positions. Uh, along those lines, um, when you talk about the reason you say that there's laws that are independent of God, as you said, laws are mathematics. Um, but don't you see that? I'm uh, sorry. Would you see that uh, that those are descriptions of what actually is? It's, it's something that cannot be and not be. I mean, we base that not as a prescriptive sort of thing, the way things ought to be. I mean, and I know I'm invoking morality with thought, but when we take, when we're seeing this 
become it cannot be in it. That's just something we know. But it's not something that somehow that can be violated. Well, the moral law is something that can be violated. It has sort of a volitional aspect to it. So it would seem that the law, the laws of logic, uh, logic or the laws of mathematics are descriptive. And I know prescriptive again it invokes morality in itself. But there seems to be a difference between that and rather than just uh, the way we actually see reality in the way uh, this, this idea of uh, right. Yeah. I, that's a great question, and I want, I want to concede almost everything to that question. So well, I, I want to acknowledge that there are, let's take the, the, fun, the fundamental laws of physics. I don't know what they are. I don't think anybody knows um, you know, fully what they are as yet. But whatever they are, they will describe the ultimate nature of physical reality. And they will be such that they cannot be violated. Okay. But moral laws, the fundamental moral laws, and even the derivative ones, can be violated. I think that's, that's right, and that's a difference between the two. Nevertheless, I don't, um, I don't think that that difference makes a difference to my analysis. So I, I, I want to allow that there are descriptive laws and that there are prescriptive laws. But the fact that moral laws are prescriptive, that doesn't seem to me to force us to the claim that they require an author. Um, but you can say that the claim that they, they come from an author is just the claim that they come from an author. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of your question. The, the, the idea that they, that they come from an author is the same sort of thing as saying that somebody doesn't come from themselves. It's just we have to come oh. from the point where we stop. And if Christian chooses to go to an author, and you choose to stop it, then that's this idea of itself. Right. And, and No, I don't think it's a question about the evidence, because I don't know what kind of evidence we can marshal on behalf of one view or another. I think what we're doing is armchair speculation here. I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a negative sense at all. Okay? I just mean that by, we can't marshal scientific evidence and then think that that's somehow probative, that's somehow determinative in, in settling the question of whether there are certain kinds of actions that are inherently immoral or uh, actions that are immoral only because God forbade them. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, so the last thing I want to say in response to your question is, I think we are ending up in different places. One person says the ultimate source of the moral laws is God's say-so, and the other one says the moral laws just are what they are, not because anyone said so. I'm not, I'm not saying God's say-so. Oh. oh, okay. Then I, then I disagree with that claim. Because um, moral laws are not God. Okay, let's let's make this your last follow-up here. Would you accept that God could be Himself in moral laws? No, no, because I think that God is an active agent. The moral law is not an agent. The moral law is a, is a code of some of of a set of rules or prescriptions. But God is much more than that. A moral law, a law doesn't create a universe. That takes a whole bunch. Of, that takes a whole bunch of powers that a simple code, or a complex code, doesn't have. So I would resist the identification, saying that they're identical, that is, God and the moral law. Do you still have a question over here? Yeah, sure. Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot, and I'm a bit confused. So if you feel like you've already answered this, don't feel pressure to answer it again. Um, it's a question about how we come to know the moral law of morality. So um, we've gone to, for instance, yeah. your uh, imaginary worst possible violation of human rights, and I don't know, immediately after that, you and the um, oppressor go out to Starbucks to get coffee. How do you defend your conception of morality in the presence of that person? Or rather, how do you okay. argue for the idea of the world? Yeah. I didn't answer this question at all, because this question is way too hard to answer. <laughs> uh, but also, Jesus, are they really paying this guy to say such lame stuff? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> I hope. I mean, I haven't gotten a check yet. Just, just kidding. Okay, so I haven't answered that question, because the, que the question is one of the deepest, hardest questions in ethics. The question really is, how do you gain moral knowledge? Okay. So I've got seven minutes all told. I think I could do it in three. Just kidding. 
I can't do it in three. But what I want to say is this. I'll say just a couple things, though. That's not going to be the whole story, of course. A couple things. One is that if we were to go out to Starbucks, how would I try to explain it? The answer is I try to explain it at at least arm's length because the guy's such a mean guy. I don't know what he could do to me. But um, imagine this situation. Imagine that I, you know, I give the best argument I can against torture. I give a whole bunch of arguments, say, like, how would you like it if someone did that to you, for instance? What makes you so special that you think you've got the prerogative to exercise this kind of power over someone else? Don't you think in many other cases, the imposition of extreme pain like that is immoral? You know, to give them, you know there's, some, there's a lot to be said, actually. But I, I bet you're imagining someone who says, <laughs> he says, your, your reasons mean nothing. To, they, they carry no weight to me. You know, I'm a law unto myself. It, it, you know, how would I like if somebody did that to me? Not much, but I'm not them. <laughs> yeah. The bottom line is that I think that there are cases in which we'll be unable to convince even very smart people. I mean, this guy could be a mastermind of evil, right? He could be really a superior brain. Right? And we might be able to, we might be, I'm sorry, unable to convince him. What, where does that leave us? Does that leave us um, forced with the thought that therefore there is no objective morality? Uh-uh. It doesn't leave us with that thought at all. The, f- the fact that people might continue to disagree about moral matters does not mean that there is no objective morality. In just the same way that brilliant physicists, not in just the same way, but here's an analogy, analogy Brilliant physicists might disagree about what the fundamental particles or fundamental elements of matter are. They might actually continue to disagree because different theories might be each internally coherent and explain a lot, but be incompatible with one another. And you might have adherence of one, might have adherence of the other, and they might go to Starbucks and they might continue to disagree. But there's still an objective truth, a whole set of objective truths about the nature of, about the fundamental nature of matter. And I think the same thing is true in ethics. We might not be able to get everybody to agree, even really smart people to agree, but that doesn't mean that there is no, sorry to double negative, that doesn't mean that there's no objective morality. Okay, I'm going to go to Paul here, and then Will, if we have time. Oh. Thanks, Doctor. Um, you really have done a great job, I think, of outlining. Um, Why don't you stand up so people yeah, can see that? <laughs> the disembodied voice behind the lectern. <laughs> Uh, I really appreciated the job you did in outlining the, uh, the objections to the divine command theory, at least in the world as we see it. I was wondering how your idea plays into the idea that God created the world and the situation as it is now. Um, obviously, your theory more describes God as, I guess, an observer, and then uh, issuing his commands based on what he knew uh, would be the case. How does that play into the idea that God created the, the situation as it is now? Right. Does that go back to divine command theory? How does that work? Well, uh, God created the situation as it is now. That is, it's not, the, it's not that you're envisioning God having created the torture situation as it is now. For instance, human beings will have done that. But you might say, well, you know, um, how, how can we square this idea? One, that God is, as you put it, an observer. God's, uh, as I would put it, say, the infallible relayer of moral truth without being the author of moral truth. How can we square that thought with the thought that God's the creator of everything? Right? Or what I'd say is God, God's the creator of everything. That's a tagline that's not literally true. Because God's not the creator of the laws of logic, for instance. And God's not the creator of himself. That's a little more theologically, theologically contentious. But on the assumption that God has existed in eternity, God doesn't have a creator. God is... Uh, okay. Okay. Um, and I also think that God is not the, the author of the moral laws either. Okay, so what, I, what I'd want to say is this. God, having existed always, has always known that things such as torture are wrong. Even though there were billions of years before anyone was in a position to torture anyone. Still, the prohibition on, we can say, why is torture wrong? We can say because it violates this prohibition. Namely, the prohibition on gratuitous cruelty. And even before there was any such thing as gratuitous cruelty, God knew the nature of gratuitous cruelty and saw that it was wrong. So I think we can square it, actually, without much difficulty by saying God created a world that's been around for uh, billions of years, and what's, what's, what's happened is that it's only very recently that there have been folks around who are capable of torturing one another and being susceptible of moral criticism. 
Nevertheless, God knew all the way, way back that someday there would be beings like this, saw what torture amounts to, even before there was any such thing, and saw that it was wrong. So we can square the two in that way, I think, without, without inconsistency. Well, maybe the last. I'm kind of, I'm interested in your claim that the objective morality is compatible with atheism. It seems that that the only reason that I'm able to be a moral agent is is because my mom is a moral agent that gives me morality, some kind of framework within which I could interact with people in the world, uh, speak to them without some kind of fear that I would uh, eat them. I don't know, like anything that I needed her to <laughs> accomplish so okay the game. Things like I needed her to give me some kind of framework within which I could even you know the chance to interact with other people and reason out morality. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems like there's a regress that goes back to the to some wanton somewhere back in the evolutionary chain who was able to and it seems without God telling that wanton what morality is I mean, Somebody's telling that want that want and you have to reason it out on his own and, and I'm not sure if someone could to make to make a good argument for how that could be. Yeah, well, that actually is a variation on this earlier set of questions about how we can gain moral knowledge, uh, to which I ad- admitted I don't, I can't give, I don't actually have a full picture of it in the first place, true confession, but I can't do justice to it in just a very short amount of time. But I think that um, I think there's uh, there. What I'll do is actually tr- that rather than try to provide a positive account of how to gain moral knowledge in 76 seconds. I'll instead try to uh, offer a kind of partners in crime analogy. That's, I'm going to say there's a like problem whether you're a theist or an atheist. The problem is how do you get moral knowledge. If you're a theist, you might say, oh, I know how to get moral knowledge. It's here in my favorite Bible. But of course, someone's going to say, how do you pick your Bible? <laughs> and if you pick the right Bible, how do you pick the right interpretation? Because you know what? There are a whole bunch of really smart people who don't share your interpretation of that particular text. And at bottom, it's not clear how you're going to answer those questions. You might say, well, you know, I got, I got direct word um, that this was it. But, of course, other people got, you know, feel that they've got direct words, and um, what they got was completely different from what you got. So how do you know, given that difference, that you got the right one, okay, that you're really listening a right? It's hard to answer that question, okay? And it's hard for the, the, for the atheist to answer that question, too. You know, um, atheists have a lot of different strategies for trying to answer that question, many, many of which in general form are identical to one that the theist has, in general form. The difference, of course, is that they're not going to ultimately say, we got the source because God handed it down to us. But the general strategies actually are quite similar. In both cases, for instance, some people might say some moral views are just self-evident. That is, if you really think without the intrusion of self-interest, bias, ignorance, if you can somehow cull all these distorting factors out and just contemplate, say, the nature of torture, you'll see, you'll see it for what it is, namely immoral. And the theist is going to say something like that. If you, if you factor out all the distorting all the distorting influences, some claims will just strike you as clearly true. They wouldn't strike the moral wanton as true. That's right. So how would the moral wanton become such that he could decide that torture is wrong? Um, it may be that the moral wanton, uh, what the person you're, the moral wanton as someone who wasn't raised in a moral household, say, or without moral influence, couldn't see it. It may be that that person couldn't see it, but in the same way you might say, well, there are many people who were raised in societies without access to religious instruction either, and there's no way that they could have seen the accurate, you know, gain accurate religious instruction either. It may be that someone, um, someone uh, was just finally struck with a sympathetic compassionate understanding of human suffering and saw that that was wrong without being taught it or you might say, you know, if you're a theist, someone heard God's voice without being raised in a religious household or a religious society, and that person couldn't be sure of what he was experiencing, but nevertheless felt compelled enough to 
feel confident enough to try to promulgate that message. So I think there are st the same general kinds of strategies are available to members of both camps, both the theist and the atheist camp. Well, thank you for all your fine questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.